Our next presentation is sponsored by the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society. Dr. Billy Kaiser received his PhD in 2016 from Arizona State University and is currently Associate Professor and Department Chair at Texas A&M University at San Antonio. A specialist on the 19th century U.S.-Mexico borderlands, he teaches classes on the Civil War and Reconstruction, the American West, Native American history, U.S. foreign policy, and research methods. Kaiser is the author of numerous articles and five books, the most recent being Illusions of Empire, The Civil War and Reconstruction in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands, published by University of Pennsylvania Press. His current book project involves scalp warfare in the North American borderlands spanning the 1600s through the 1800s. He will be presenting a few hundred dollars worth of Mexican justice, Civil War scheming in the Texas-Mexico borderlands. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Billy Kaiser. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lila, for the introduction. And thank you especially to all of the General Land Office staff for your work in organizing this great event. I'd like to start with a really quick interactive exercise. Um, I'm going to say a phrase, and I'd like everybody in the room to just remember the first word or phrase that comes to mind when you hear this. Ready? You don't, tell, don't tell your neighbor, just remember it. The American Civil War. Now raise your hand if the first thing that came to mind was slavery, emancipation, or something related to it. Raise your hand if the first thing that came to mind was Gettysburg, Antietam, or something related to a battle. Abraham Lincoln. How about Mexico? I was hoping that that would happen. <laughs> if, if half the room had raised their hand, I would have been suspicious. We typically don't think about Mexico when we think about the American Civil War. Um, with my short time here today, I hope to, um, to demonstrate the ways in which Mexico did in fact play an important role during the war, and especially uh, to demonstrate that some of the leading figureheads in both the Union and Confederate governments saw Mexico as a central component of their grand strategies in fighting the Civil War. So before I proceed with sort of a, a chronological series of, of events or narratives, I just want to lay a little bit of contextual groundwork. And I'd like you to remember uh, this context throughout the course of this presentation. The first context is borderlands. And I'll define borderlands, I'll quote uh, Brian DeLay in one of his books uh, as describing borderlands as regions that are largely defined by pluralities of sovereignty, places where Multiple nations, um, and nations can be indigenous nations, they can be traditional nation states, compete for power and control over a region, but none of those, uh, none of those entities are able to completely uh, control the region. So what emerges is a atmosphere of contested power and authority in which no actor is able to hold full sway. And the U.S.-Mexico borderlands fits this description quite well. Uh, it fit this description during the Civil War era, and it still fits this description quite well today. Another way of thinking about borderlands are that these are places that consistently confound the best laid plans of empires, nations, and states. The second context I'd like you to keep in mind is diplomacy. And when we think of diplomacy, we often uh, think of traditional diplomacy conducted uh, at a federal level between nation states. Right? The US State Department, for example, conducts formal diplomacy with other nations around the world. Uh, in the context of the Civil War era US-Mexico borderlands, what emerged was an irregular form of diplomacy in which many regional actors acted autonomously and conducted sort of irregular, surreptitious acts of diplomacy on their own. And to that end, I'd like to point out a third context, and this sort of builds off Sarah Rodriguez's um, uh, presentation earlier, with Mexican federalism. 
It's important to understand that during the Civil War era, the governors of the northern Mexican states uh, largely operated with a, uh, a mindset of federalism or regionalism, what they called in Mexico, sentimiento de la región, regionalist sentiment, sentiment of the region. Many of these Mexican governors were perfectly willing to act autonomously of the Mexican national government to pursue their own regional agendas uh, through diplomacy. So with all of those contexts established, I'd like to begin with the very earliest days of the Civil War, uh, right around the time that uh, Fort Sumter, South Carolina was, uh, was bombarded and the war officially began. This is long before the first Battle of Bull Run, long before either side really knew that this was going to be a long, protracted, bloody war. And it's really telling to know that on both sides, both the Confederacy and the Union, the highest level uh, administrators, the secretaries of state and the presidents, here you have the Secretary of State Robert Toombs of the Confederacy and William Seward of the United States, and Presidents Jeff Davis and, uh, and Abraham Lincoln, they were already thinking very seriously about Mexico and how Mexico was going to play into their strategies for fighting and potentially winning the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln in April 1861 tells Seward, be just, liberal, frank, and magnanimous towards Mexico. It can never be an enemy. William Seward at the same time, the mission to Mexico, and he's referring to a diplomatic mission that was dispatched as a result of this meeting between Lincoln and Seward, the mission to Mexico will be the most interesting and important one within our whole circle of international relations. Here's Lincoln and Seward saying, Mexico is extremely important to us. They're not talking about Great Britain. They're not talking about France. They're not talking about European powers. They're talking about Mexico, which is really sort of uh, incredible when you think about the grand global context of the Civil War. At the same time, in Montgomery, Alabama, this was before the Confederate capital had even been moved to Richmond. You have the first Confederate Secretary of State, Robert Toombs. The Confederate States of America must cultivate the most amicable, amicable relations with Mexico. And again, Robert Toombs, the institution of domestic slavery in one country and that of peonage in the other established between them such a similarity. So uh, you can, in, in Toombs' comments, you can already, you can sort of sense a little bit of, uh, of the, the Southern filibustering that had been going on for years before the Civil War, the idea of expanding slavery southward into Mexico. But you see from, from both perspectives, North and South, they're thinking a lot about Mexico and how Mexico might play a role in their ability to fight the Civil War. And it's also important context to, um, to point out here that the North had implemented its anaconda plan, the blockade of southern ports, uh, very early on in the, in the secession crisis. So Mexico for the Confederacy plays a important role as sort of a way around that blockade. The Union blockade could not extend beyond the mouth of the Rio Grande because blockading uh, the Mexican coastland would have been considered an act of war. Lincoln did not want to be at war with Mexico at the same time that he was at war with the Confederacy. So following these meetings between these highest level uh, uh, politicians, North and South, they each send a diplomat down to Mexico City. The Union sends Thomas Corwin. Corwin was a fairly experienced diplomat, a very wise choice to send to Mexico City, and he held the, um, the role of, uh, of U.S. diplomat there for about four years, um, almost to the end of the Civil War, and his son eventually um, uh, replaced him. Corwin's objective was primarily to, um, to maintain, as, uh, as Lincoln had said, the most amicable relations with, uh, with Mexico, with, uh, with Benito Juarez, president of Mexico. And Corwin did so through the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City because there was already a formal diplomacy established between the two nations. The Confederacy sent John Pickett, not to be confused with George Pickett of Gettysburg infamy. John Pickett was, on the other hand, a rather poor choice for a diplomat. The Confederacy had a tendency throughout the Civil War to pick really, really bad people to be diplomats. Uh, Pickett's Qualification, the reason he was chosen and sent to Mexico City, was that he had uh, a few years earlier spent a few weeks in Veracruz, and this uh, apparently 
made him familiar enough with uh, Mexican politics, Mexican culture, to be the Confederacy's official representative and diplomatic agent in Mexico City. Uh, as it turned out, however, Pickett uh, was deeply racist towards the Mexican people. He openly disdained uh, uh, the Mexican people, made it no secret. Uh, he offended people everywhere that he went in Mexico City, including, uh, including uh, high-level high officials in the Juarez government, including uh, uh, the foreign minister, Lero de Tejada. Pickett, within a matter of just a few days, managed to get arrested for beating up a union sympathizer in a bar in Mexico City. And he subsequently tried to claim diplomatic immunity, but was denied because Mexico did not formally recognize the Confederate States of America. And he then bribed his way out of jail and wrote back to Richmond saying that he had been, compel quote, compelled to purchase a few hundred dollars worth of Mexican justice. He left Veracruz, uh, returned to, uh, uh, to Virginia, and spent the rest of the war trying to convince the Confederate government to reimburse him the bribe money that he had paid to get himself out of jail in Mexico City. This was the extent of, of the Confederacy's formal diplomatic outreach to Mexico in a formal capacity uh, uh, between Richmond and Mexico City. From that point on, the Confederacy hatched multiple schemes to try to develop diplomatic relations, but not with Mexico City, not with the, the Mexican national government, with individual governors along the border. Not long after Pickett returned in disgrace to, uh, to the South, a major war breaks out in Mexico. We call this the French intervention. This is important to understand because this is essentially a, a civil war going on in Mexico where the centralists and the Catholic Church largely uh, uh, align themselves with, uh, with Emperor Napoleon III, uh, Emperor Maximilian, who was sent to Mexico um, to represent the Mexican Empire, and the, uh, the, Federalist, uh, the Federalists who aligned themselves with President Benito Juarez. The fact that Mexico was simultaneously embroiled in its own war at the same time that the United States was embroiled in its own war is significant because that enables actors on both sides in these borderlands an incredible degree of autonomy. The Mexican national government, Juarez, had no ability, while waging war against the French, he had no ability to enforce the rule of law along the border. Uh, and this, this then enabled governors like, uh, like Santiago Vidari, who I'll talk about in a minute, to sort of uh, pursue their own ambitions through diplomacy with the French, with, uh, with uh, the Confederacy, uh, and so on. This French intervention will last until 1867. So it is, it is occurring simultaneously alongside the Civil War. And, and as I said, really enables a lot of this irregular diplomacy in the borderlands between North and South. So I'm going to break this down geographically into the Confederacy's approach to diplomacy in Northwestern Mexico and then Northeastern Mexico, because the Confederacy had very different objectives in the two places. In Northwestern Mexico, here you see a map showing the route that, uh, that Sibley's brigade used uh, during the invasion of New Mexico, a very well-known event. I won't go into that at all here today, other than to say that there's a very important and very little-known sidelight to that Confederate invasion of New Mexico. And that involved, here you see Sibley on the bottom right, that involved Colonel James Riley on the top right. Riley was the second highest ranking officer in Sibley's brigade, uh, second only to Sibley. And Riley uh, had previous political experience. He was from Texas, had lived in Texas for many years, uh, had been a lawyer, a politician. He also had some diplomatic experience, uh, not all that much more than Pickett, though. Uh, Riley's diplomatic experience was during the James Buchanan administration when he was named the American minister plenipotentiary to Russia. Uh, Riley, in uh, in true Texas form, arrived in St. Petersburg, spent two weeks there, and wrote back that it was, quote, too cold, and resigned his post and came back to Texas. So James Riley had about two weeks of diplomatic experience in Russia. Um, Riley, once Sibley's brigade reached southern New Mexico, the Mesilla Valley, Las Cruces, Riley was dispatched on a secret mission to Chihuahua and Sonora. 
to meet privately with the governors there, with Governor Luis Terrazas, who you see on the bottom left, and Governor Ignacio Pesqueira of Sonora on the top left. And Riley's mission was to open diplomatic relations with those two governors. And he had a list of objectives that he was uh, supposed to try to achieve. Uh, those objectives included uh, opening a supply line through Mexico to, to supply the Confederate Army in New Mexico. Uh, one of those objectives included um, asking for Mexican uh, military support during the Confederate invasion of New Mexico. All of these things the governors denied. Uh, uh, to, uh, to Riley, and Riley also had instructions to try, if possible, to convince ter both Terrazas and Pescaida to, uh, to essentially commit treason against Mexico to secede from Mexico in the same way that the southern states had seceded from the United States and to join the Confederacy and basically extend the boundary of Texas all the way to the Gulf of California. This would have given the Confederacy an outlet on the Pacific Ocean at the port at Huaymas in Sonora. That was the end game, right? A, another way around the naval blockade and a port on the Pacific. This would have dramatically enlarged the Confederacy's boundaries. It would have made Sonora and Chihuahua part of the Confederate States of America. And as you might imagine, had that plan actually materialized, could have altered the course of the American Civil War. At the same time, Union diplomacy in northwestern Mexico was largely directed at undermining or sabotaging Confederate diplomacy. The Union uh, wasn't particularly interested in the context of the Civil War of taking literal possession of Chihuahua and Sonora, but they were very interested in preventing Chihuahua and Sonora from giving themselves over to the Confederacy. So to this end, in New Mexico and California, the, the two uh, military department commanders, that was James Carleton in New Mexico and that was George Wright, in Calif uh, the commander of the Department of the Pacific in California, their mode of diplomacy was to write very threatening letters to Pescaida and Terrazas telling them if you, uh, if you cooperate in any way with the Confederacy, we will invade your states and we will utterly destroy you. And this was more than enough to prevent uh, either of those governors, neither of whom were inclined towards the Confederacy in the first place, from, from in any way formally recognizing the Confederacy. Nonetheless, Riley, uh, he, in both of his meetings, he met with both of these governors. They actually you know, admitted him to, uh, uh, to their governor's palaces, met with him, talked to him. Uh, after the mission failed, he wrote back to Sibley and said that the mission was a complete success and that he had extracted from Governor Terrazas the first official rec foreign recognition of the Confederate States of America, which of course then goes back to Jeff Davis and, and creates some excitement among the Confederacy that we have just been formally recognized. And the idea being if one, if one uh, and, and, and when they, they extrapolated from Terrazas that this was Mexican recognition, Mexico has recognized us. Uh, and, and the idea being, well, if one country will recognize us, then maybe others will recognize us, and so on and so forth. So by the time Riley returned to the Mesilla Valley from his mission to, to Chihuahua and Sonora, Sibley's army had already been defeated at the Battle of Glorieta, uh, March 22, uh, 25th, 26th of 1862, east of Santa Fe, and uh, Sibley's brigade was retreating back towards uh, El Paso and into Texas. So the entire mission into New Mexico and into the far west had already failed, and Riley arrived just in time to catch the, the army retreating back into Texas. And that was really the extent of Confederate irregular diplomacy or diplomatic outreach in northwestern Mexico. Uh, you, you can see how it could have potentially altered the course of the war, um, but it didn't. They were, the Confederates were trying to take advantage of what they knew about Mexican federalism and Mexican regionalism. They knew after several decades of Mexican independence and, uh, and, and, and the course of Mexican politics, they knew that, that many of those governors along the border in northern Mexico uh, and their population, the local populations of, of uh, fronterizos were, might be inclined to act independently or autonomously of their, their national government. <clears throat> 
Okay. And here are a couple of, of quotes related to this expedition into northwestern Mexico. Here's Henry Hop Hopkins Sibley in 1861 after he arrives in Mesilla. By geographical position, by similarity of institutions, by commercial interests, and by future destinies, New Mexico pertains to the Confederacy. So this is very much a, a manifest destiny-minded um, sort of idea about Confederate expansionism into the far west. Here's James Riley. As he uh, departed in January 1862 into Chihuahua at the beginning of his mission, we must have Chihuahua and Sonora. With Chihuahua and Sonora, we gain Southern California and render our state of Texas the great highway of nations. At the same time, the New York Times informed its readers that the Confederates are playing fine games in that distracted country. And here you have George Wright, who I alluded to a minute ago, the uh, department commander in, in San Francisco, Department of, of uh, the Pacific. Utter devastation and ruin would inevitably befall the beautiful state of Sonora should the rebel forces gain a foothold within its limits. That's a letter that he sent directly to Governor Pescaida. In northeastern Mexico, the Confederacy was not nearly as concerned with trying to take physical possession of territory to expand their, their geopolitical boundaries. They were much more concerned with maintaining the good graces of the Mexican governors in Coahuila, Nuevo León, and, and Tamaulipas because they were highly dependent, especially in Texas and in the Trans-Mississippi uh, uh, theater of, uh, of the Civil War, they were highly dependent on northeastern Mexico as a corridor to get their cotton out around the uh, Union Naval blockade and also to import war material from Europe. So different objectives in northeastern Mexico, but nonetheless very crucial to the Confederate war effort during, uh, during the Civil War. On the upper left, you see Santiago Vidaurri, the governor of, uh, of Nuevo León during, uh, during this time. Vidaurri, um, very early on in the Civil War, uh, offered to, um, to join the Confederacy to take Coahuila and Nuevo Leon, both states, and to append them to Texas in much the same way that Riley had hoped to do with Chihuahua and Sonora. Um, Jeff Davis and the Confederate government declined that, uh, um, that offer for, for various reasons. Uh, but Vidalri demonstrated himself to be very much inclined towards working with the Confederacy, primarily because doing so would enable him to enrich himself. Vidalri was always interested, first and foremost, about Vidalri. Whatever was best for Vidalri was what Vidalri was going to do. Uh, and he managed to prop, find ways to profit during the Civil War from the Confederacy's dependency on northeastern Mexico for its, uh, for its economic lifeline around the naval blockade. At one point, uh, Vidalri blackmailed the Confederate, uh, Confederate troops in South Texas into fighting and killing one of his political enemies. And he blackmailed them uh, by raising the tariff on cotton that he was charging and telling the, uh, the regional Texas Confederate officers that he would lower that tariff once they eliminated his, uh, uh, this particular individual. And so they did. Um, and it's also indicative of Vidalri's uh, sort of regionalism that he was imposing tariffs on his own uh, because tariffs are, again, a part of, of, of international relations that are not conducted by individual governors. They're, they're supposed to be handled at the national level. Vidalri was pocketing a lot of that customs revenue. He managed all the customs houses, and through his son-in-law, Patricio Milmo, he managed to funnel a lot of that money through uh, Milmo's uh, uh, merchant houses, business houses, and, and, and the two of them became very wealthy at the expense of the, of the Confederacy during the Civil War. In another instance, Vidalri and his son-in-law Milmo uh, confiscated 16 briefcases from a Confederate quartermaster who was traveling through Mexico into Texas, 16 briefcases full of Confederate money, uh, millions of dollars worth of, uh, of, of Confederate money, and they held that, uh, those briefcases and that cash for ransom until the Texas Cotton Bureau agent Simeon Hart paid them for about 2,000 um, uh, bales of cotton that, uh, that they were owed for. So Vidalri and was very adept at, at uh, using his political status uh, as a governor in Mexico for his own benefit to take advantage of the Confederacy's dependency during the Civil War. On the bottom left, you see uh, General Hamilton B of Texas. Uh, B 
uh, at one point in 1862, negotiated a private deal with the governor um, of Alvino Lopez of Tamaulipas, of a private deal to uh, ensure the free passage of cotton, Confederate cotton southward and, uh, and war material northward into Texas. And also the deal involved extradition of, um, of what the, uh, the Confederacy called uh, traitors, um, we might also call them refugees, uh, B wanted, and the Texans in general, wanted the Mexican governors to arrest and, uh, and detain Texan unionists who were fleeing to Mexico and send them back to Texas for punishment and possible execution. And the other side of the deal was that Lopez and, and other Mexican governors wanted the Confederacy to detain runaway debt peons who were running north uh, into, uh, into Texas uh, for freedom. And, and Texas also wanted, there were some runaway slaves from Texas, uh, chattel slaves. And, and, and so, so there was sort of like a mutual extradition kind of an agreement involved in this. But again, this is a, a, a formal treaty between a governor of a state and a military officer. That's not what you think of when you think of treaties between nations. And ultimately, it's, it's really unenforceable. And within a, few, a couple of months, Lopez was no longer governor anyways, and a new governor came in, and B is, d is down in Mexico again trying to negotiate a new deal with the new governor, uh, Manuel Ruiz in, in, in Tamaulipas. And on the, bottom, on the bottom right is John Bankhead Magruder, another Confederate officer instrumental in, uh, in leading a lot of this localized Confederate diplomatic outreach towards, uh, towards Mexico. And on the top right is perhaps the only legitimately effective diplomat that the Confederacy had during the Civil War. That's Jose Agustin Quintero. He was a Cuban, uh, Cuban by birth. And he, the Confederacy kept him uh, in, uh, in Monterrey throughout much of the Civil War. And he worked directly with Santiago Vidalri to, uh, to ensure the, um, that those customs houses remained open for the passage of, uh, of cotton and war material for the Confederacy. Quintero uh, was, was one of the most, as I said, one of the most effective Confederate diplomats and really was instrumental in, uh, for, the, for the Confederacy, especially in Texas, in, in keeping that, uh, that line through Northeast Mexico open. Okay, and here, again, a few quotes from this particular theater of operations. Here's Quintero. General Vidalri feels a great friendship for the South. We have gained an ally. So you get the sense over and over again, Confederates are, are, are desperately looking for anything that they can call an alliance, anything that they can call foreign recognition. In reality, Vidalri never formally recognized the Confederacy, and even if he did, he was a governor, not a representative of Mexico, and it, was, and it would have essentially been meaningless. But you can see where in these, in these quotes, these Confederates are trying to, to spin it, to make it look like we've been recognized, to make it, you know, to advertise this and to try to then encourage other foreign entities to recognize them as well. At the same time, uh, 1861, the New York Times, again reporting on this for their northern readership, the government of the Confederate States are determined to extract recognition from somebody, and to that end, Toombs has opened diplomatic correspondence with Vidalry. Right, so you can see this is sort of a, a sarcastic, you know, kind of a tongue-in-cheek comment from the New York Times. Again, uh, here's, uh, here's the Confederacy. Uh, they'll take anything they can get when it comes to foreign relations. And so now they're talking to Vidalry, trying to get recognition from him. Here's Hamilton B. Uh, in the midst of negotiating these, these localized uh, deals with Mexican governors. It is of utmost importance to the Confederacy that Brownsville and the line of the Rio Grande should be held. And he's referring primarily there to the Union Naval Blockade. Without that route around the blockade through, um, through northeastern Mexico, it becomes extremely difficult for the South to export much of its cotton and import that war material. Finally, Mindert Kimmy, he was a U.S. diplomat stationed in Monterrey throughout, uh, um, for a couple of years during the Civil War. Millions of dollars worth of cotton is sold here monthly, all of which is sent back to the rebels. Until this trade is cut off, Texas will not feel the blockade. So whereas in northwestern Mexico, the U.S. government and its diplomats were attempting to, to sabotage or, or block Confederate diplomacy to prevent the Confederates from expanding geographically and gaining uh, a, an outlet, a port on the Pacific. Here in northeastern Mexico, U.S. diplomatic agents in, uh, in, in Monterrey and in, uh, in Matamoros are primarily trying to uh, 
convince these governors not to let the Confederacy ship their cotton through Mexico to try to, to cut off that trade. And they were not successful throughout the Civil War. At no point during the Civil War did any of these US diplomats in Northeastern Mexico successfully convince a Mexican governor to block that trade, to cut off the customs houses along the lower Rio Grande Valley, uh, and, and primarily because those Mexican governors were making a lot of money from it. They were enriching themselves dramatically uh, f um, by managing these customs houses. And again, I point back to the French intervention and why they were able to do that. Because Benito Juarez and the Mexican government was not able to enforce or punish uh, these, these regionalist governors who were essentially committing treason by managing local diplomacy and by uh, by handling tariffs and the customs houses themselves and pocketing most of that money. So, in the grand scheme of the American Civil War, throughout the entirety of that conflict, both sides saw Mexico as crucial, not just to their foreign relations, but also by extension as crucial to their strategies in fighting one another uh, and in attempting to win that Civil War. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have one question. Um, this idea of creating a port on uh, the uh, Pacific coast, uh, could you expand on that about the railroads? Uh, you know, the Confederacy, were they interested in expanding, getting a transcontinental route to the Pacific, and was Mexico the way to go? And was the Union trying to prevent that from happening? Just, do you have any resources or thoughts about that concept? Southerners were, had long been very interested in transcontinental railroads. Jefferson Davis, when he was Secretary of War uh, in the Franklin Pierce administration, was, uh, led the Pacific Railway surveys, and it was no coincidence that the, uh, the route that he suggested was the southernmost route that would have put the Pacific Railway through Texas, uh, uh, from Louisiana through Texas to Southern California. Of course, that uh, did not materialize uh, in the context of antebellum sectionalism and, and, uh, and not till after the war was the Transcontinental Railroad finally completed and of course on a northern route. Uh, so the Confederacy certainly, had they been successful in convincing these two governors in Chihuahua and Sonora uh, to join them, that, uh, that route to Guaymas, to, to the Gulf of California, would have been a wagon route and it would have taken, uh, they, they wanted to build a railroad, but they didn't have the ability to do it. In the, uh, the South, even, even in the South proper, uh, had very few railroads during the Civil War, very uh, under-industrialized compared to the North. And the South simply did not have, and would not have been able to, uh, did not have the capability and would not have been able to build that railroad quick enough during the war um, for, for that to have, have, uh, have actually materialized although it was certainly within their, uh, within their ideas and plans. Within a, I swore I wasn't gonna do that. Everybody. <laughs> uh, but it was more in their long-term plan uh, of, of winning the war, uh, gaining independence as a independent Confederate States of America and making themselves basically a, a, a transcontinental coast-to-coast -coast empire, so to speak, uh, from, from the, uh, the Atlantic to the Pacific. And it really also speaks to, you know, um, the title of my book is Illusions of Empire. There's a lot of illusions going on here. A lot of people, especially Southerners, have these illusions that all of these, uh, that if we can only get uh, Sonora and Chihuahua, then we can, you know, that'll save us. If we can only get, uh, you know, uh, northeastern Mexico, et cetera. Uh, in hindsight, it's, these were, were, these were pipe dreams, right? This was just a lot of daydreaming. But... I, but it's important not to think about it too much in hindsight and to think about it in the context of the times because they took it very seriously at the time. You know, and, and when you have Abraham Lincoln who is repeatedly throughout the Civil War concerning himself with what's going on in Mexico and Jeff Davis repeatedly concerning himself to the extent that just a few weeks before uh, uh, Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox, Jeff Davis had, had granted approval for another Confederate invasion of New Mexico. To, they were going to try it again under, Colonel, under John Robert Baylor, uh, who had been involved in the first invasion. 
was the, was the quest for the Transcontinental Railroad a cause of the Civil War? Was, was the quest for a Transcontinental Railroad, even though it was illusory, a, a motivating cause of secession that is kind of under, under, underestimated in uh, how we view the Civil War today? So the Pacific Railway surveys and the debates between Northerners and Southerners over where that railroad would be located, whether a Northern or a Southern route, was one of many major issues in the 15 years leading up to the Civil War that ultimately uh, led to Southern secession. We could point to Texas annexation in 1845. We could point to uh, the U.S.-Mexico War and uh, the, um, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the dramatic expansion of, uh, of U.S. boundaries uh, into the American West. We could point to popular sovereignty, uh, political debates in Congress, uh, Dred Scott, there's this, this 15 to 20 year series of events and the Pacific Railway surveys are a central part of that. And they certainly added even more division uh, to, uh, uh, to the Northern and, and Southern sections within the context of sectionalism. Uh, but it wasn't those surveys in and of themselves that led to the Civil War. Um, it, it was, but, but nonetheless, they, 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 they divided the country even further at a time when, when the country was rapidly dividing already over the slave issue. So the uh, participation of Santos Benavides and others along the southern border was probably more of a local loyalty thing than any national or international negotiations or loyalties or anything? And so Santos Benavides was, um, was a Confederate officer operating in the lower Rio Grande borderlands. Uh, Jerry Thompson wrote a great biography of him just a few years ago. Um, Benavides was instrumental in Confederate military operations in the region. Uh, he was involved in uh, the Confederate attempts to crack down on, on banditry in the region. Um, there were uh, several uh, bandit groups. Uh, one of them was Octaviano Zapata, uh, who were operating on both sides of the border, basically border hopping. You know, they didn't recognize either, either nation or their sovereignty. They were more interested in uh, you know, taking advantage of this borderlands environment for their own gain. And, uh, and, 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 and so Benavides was largely, and his troops were, and, and he commanded a fairly small contingent of troops, uh, were largely involved in, in efforts to sort of suppress that, um, the, that, that sort of independent banditry along the border. Um, at one point in, um, uh, in 1863, the Union Army invaded uh, the, the lower Rio Grande and, and occupied Fort Brown and Brownsville. And, uh, and, and did so for several months, but then left in 1864. And at that time, that was the only period during the Civil War when the cotton trade and commerce was cut off through Brownsville, Matamoros. And, but the only thing that happened is they just shifted it up the river and the Confederates started shipping their cotton up to Laredo and Eagle Pass and then taking it down uh, on the Mexican side uh, where the, the US troops couldn't do anything about it. There was a really good article in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly several years ago about how prosperous Houston, the city of Houston was during the Civil War because it was linked to that trade down across the river and through Matamoros. Uh, you know, they were giving piano lessons to their children when others were starving across the South. And the reason, one of the reasons I never paid tuition when I went to college is because William Marsh Rice was exporting Texas cotton down through Matamoros. How far beyond Houston, or did it go beyond Houston, that prosperity that came to Texas from the, from the trade across the Rio Grande? I, I don't know specifically in terms of, um, so Houston was, was near the, the westernmost railroad terminus for the Confederacy. So the Confederacy was able to ship its cotton that was grown in Louisiana, Mississippi, et cetera. They were able to ship it on railroads as far as Houston and a little bit further uh, west of Houston. And from there, it had to go on wagons all the way down uh, to the lower Rio Grande Valley. So, so yeah, Houston was really, the city of Houston was, was a central component of that, uh, that transportation network and that played a major role in that prosperity that you're referring to. Uh, aside from Houston, uh, the main economic prosperity that resulted from this, uh, this trade was in Brownsville. And that was where uh, uh, Charles Stillman, um, uh, the, the Kings, the Kennedys, these, uh, um, these men became immensely wealthy during the Civil War, um, taking advantage of 
of this, uh, this Confederate lifeline, uh, if you will, through northeastern Mexico. And, and uh, Charles Stillman, um, uh, my uh, friend and, and fellow scholar David Montejano is, is working on a book on, uh, on, on the Civil War in South Texas, and, uh, and, and Stillman is a big part of that book. And um, Stillman was, you know, in the true context of these borderlands and, and, and individuals operating independently for their own, uh, you know, for their own uh, prosperity, Stillman was, was shipping cotton out of Mexico. He was facilitating the export of cotton through South Texas, through Northeastern Mexico, charging the Confederates and the Mexicans uh, fees for doing that. And he was loading it on ships, and then he was sending it not just to Europe, but he was sending it and selling it to, uh, uh, to, um, to mills in New York and Boston. The Union soldiers were wearing, they were making Union uniforms during the Civil War with cotton that was, that was snuck out of Texas through Mexico. Right? So it is, in some ways, I mean, it, it's almost, and, and you know, Stillman didn't care. His loyalty was to himself. He wasn't, his loyalty was not to the North or the South. His loyalty was to his bank account. And he became incredibly wealthy uh, during this time. So there was a, a large merchant class in Brownsville that, uh, that enriched themselves to an unbelievable degree uh, as a result of this Civil War trade. Jim, you raise a very interesting uh, question in my mind. Uh, at one point in his career, when Vidaldi was in trouble in Monterrey, he fled to Houston and spent several weeks in Houston before things settled down in Mexico so he could go back. Do you know who any of his Texas contacts were? So uh, the context for that is uh, in 1864, uh, as the French intervention is playing out in Mexico, um, the uh, Vidaldi is in Monterrey and Juarez and his army are approaching Monterrey, and they confront Vidaury there, uh, because uh, at that point uh, Vidaury has has thrown his support behind the French. At that point, it looked like the French were going to be victorious, so Vidaury was supporting the French. Before that, when it looked like they weren't, he, he claimed that he was loyal to Mexico. Uh, eventually, in 1867, Vidaury is, is executed alongside Maximilian as a traitor. Uh, but yeah, Vidaury did flee. Uh, as, as, um, as the Juarista army was approaching Monterey in 1864, and he fled to Texas, to Houston, and he met there with, um, the New York Times reported on it, uh, and, and the name of, it was a, a Confederate officer, a high-ranking Confederate officer in Houston, who uh, sort of, I guess, housed him and, 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 uh, and, enter, and, and entertained him there for, for a few weeks, but I can't remember the, the officer's name at this time. Uh, but it does speak to Vidaury's, you know, um, you know, his relations with Texans that was cultivated through this, uh, this economic network uh, during the Civil War. Oh, uh, this is very interesting. It made me remember something that's from popular history, but I think you would have a, a perspective on it. I'm sure you would. Uh, the notion that uh, the Battle of... Uh, uh, the, end, the defeat of the French, uh, that they were planning to march to help the Confederacy. Do you know this? Have you ever heard this story that uh, uh, was the battle in 1862? Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, that was, uh, that was the first battle of Puebla. Uh -huh. Yeah. So have you ever heard anything about that? Supposedly geopolitics that... Uh, the French wanted to support the Confederacy and that they would have if they hadn't been wiped out in their battles in Mexico. And that's, to, to my knowledge, that's largely hypothetical whether or not the French would have formally allied with the Confederacy um, had they been successful in Mexico. Um, as, it, as it turned out, you know, at the first Battle of Puebla, the French lost, you know, which was a shock. And that postponed that, uh, that French invasion of Mexico by a full year. And there was a second Battle of Puebla in the same place a year later in which the French were victorious. And it was after that that the French army then really started to, um, uh, to proceed throughout Mexico. And after that, that Emperor Maximilian was, uh, was installed on the throne in Mexico City uh, in 1864. Uh, the Confederate leadership very frequently um, likes to believe that the French would help them, 
if they were victorious. And so, but, you know, but the Confederates were, I mean, they were trying to, to sort of, and they were talking out of both sides of their mouths. They were trying to cut deals with, with these Mexican governors. Anybody that could help them in some way, they were willing to work with them. And at one point, uh, to, to demonstrate this, the Confederate government in Richmond in 1864 sent two different agents uh, to Mexico. Um, uh, one of them was uh, oh, Preston, I forget the last name. Um, and they sent one agent to Mexico to try to meet with the Mexican government where, where uh, Pickett had failed. And they sent another one to try to meet with the French emperor. And they were trying to cut deals at the same time with the two warring factions in Mexico. And of course, if either side had figured that out, that would have totally you know, uh, cut off any chance the Confederacy had um, uh, you know, in, 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 crea in, in creating those formal relations with one side or the other. So you see a lot of desperation and really just sort of foolhardy approaches to diplomacy grasping at straws. Um, after the Civil War ended, uh, this is really the extent to, to which I could say that um, the, the French powers in Mexico uh, helped or espoused the Confederacy. After the war ended, about 5,000 Southerners, including a lot of slave owners, including uh, some politicians, the governor of Tennessee, Isham Harris, including a lot of, uh, of, of high-ranking Confederate officers, um, Bank, uh, John Bankhead Magruder was one of them who was pictured up there earlier. Um, uh, Kirby Smith, uh, who was the Confederate commander of the Trans-Mississippi Theater, they all fled to Mexico after the war. They were afraid they were going to be punished by the Union, and, uh, and a lot of slaveholders fled and took their slaves to, to avoid emancipating their slaves. And Emperor Maximilian, uh, again, you know, representing France essentially in Mexico, the French Empire, uh, he welcomed those Southerners into Mexico, and he uh, approved a colonization charter and created colonies for those Southerners um, to, uh, to, to move to with their slaves. And he even, he, uh, he didn't recognize or legalize slavery, Maximilian, but he did legalize debt peonage, which basically gave the, these Southerners a way of keeping their slaves and just calling them debt peons. Um, but Maximilian very, there's, in, in letters, he said, you know, that he felt a sympathy for the South, and that he was, you know, uh, you know, for, for that reason. And he also part of that colonization charter involved a, a, a mandate that these Confederates moving into Mexico would also be required after a certain period of time to serve in the uh, in the military to to help the French. So he saw a potential military benefit in, fight, in fighting the Juaristas by allowing these uh, these former Confederates and military officers to go down into Mexico. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser.